Hi, good morning, everybody. Can you hear us okay? We are happy to be here. We're happy to be uh, doing another one of our, our monthly webinars on a uh, great subject. This is a subject we've been getting a lot of questions. So I'm Dr. Horn. I'm Dr. V. And yeah, we have been getting a lot of questions. So we thought we will um, try to cover some of the material and then at the end, leave a time for um, questions as well. So starting off, um, so, you know, we have been hearing a lot about coronavirus, the novel uh, 2019 virus. Um, the name for the virus is SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. But the disease is called Coronavirus 2019, short form COVID-19 infection. Yes, and that's how we'll refer to it here on out is COVID-19. This is referring to this disease, this outbreak. <laughs> So, you know, um, coronavirus, this is not the first time we all have come across, um, you know, usually our common cold um, or, um, that we get in the, especially in the winter season is caused by co coronavirus, more than four different strains. And some of the animals that are commonly found with the co common coronavirus can be camels, cattle, cats, bats. Um, but I do know that, you know, in the past we have had two uh, outbreaks, uh, the MERS infection and the SARS infection. Um, and now we have the current infection. Right, so one question we were getting from the start was, uh, can the viral respiratory panels that we do in the hospital, can this, the panels that we're currently doing detect this? And so, uh, so the answer to that is no, it, de it detects the four common types that are circulating. Yes. So usually if, if we have a, a positive coronavirus on our panel, we would tell the family um, it's the same as having a cold, yes. cold virus. And so the, the four that we test for, and then, like you mentioned, the MERS and the SARS. Um, and then this is the seventh one uh, that, that uh, uh, affects people and that, that's looked at and everything. So um, coronavirus, and so if you have a positive coronavirus, there are reports of, you know, if a child goes in and they have a respiratory panel and they have a coronavirus, the family freaks out. So some hospitals have actually taken it off and they don't test for the usual coronaviruses anymore because the, the family goes, uh, you know, get so upset or so, so yeah. worried. But as far as, as healthcare, um, um, you know, uh, workers, we are, it's important to know that in respiratory pathogen screen, those are the common coronavirus that causes cold um, and, you know, flu-like symptoms in the past, in, currently and in the past, and it cannot detect the novel coronavirus. And so when you're hearing in the news about um, going from different animals, so I think the idea was in, in these markets, they have bats and then they have uh, this uh, pangolin, uh, this, and this anteater, this scaly anteater, which is I think one of the most trafficked animals in the world, uh, right next to each other. So the, the virus can go into one, into another, and then into people. Um, and so that's kind of when you hear of, of it going from one animal to another. So it's not, I, so it's, it's from the animals being next to each other, breathing on each other. So, you know, I think it's really important for us to like um, understand what this virus does too and how it spreads. Um, and, you know, the more information that we have, I think the less um, uh, anxiety we have. Uh, exactly. And then yep. we could all do the right thing. Because right now, all the questions we're getting is a lot of people are kind of scared. And, um, and we want to kind of make sure by end of this uh, webinar that we have the answers to questions and we're well informed and we're not scared yes it's really the unknown yes i i think uh you know we haven't talked too much about this but i think we see we we think alike in so yeah. many, so many ways that it's really not knowing and not knowing is is a really the scary part and yes. so hearing things in the news and oftentimes you know when the news reports something it doesn't say it in medical terms and yes. because of that there's there are a lot of questions that, yeah. that we have about uh, just about everything about it. So the more you learn about it, it the, the anxiety level hopefully comes yeah. down. And what else I think is, will also help is then, then we could tell our patients in a way they understand yes. as well. So how does um, uh, COVID-19 spread? It's a person to person uh, spread. So if somebody is sick, if you stand six feet from them, that's the best distance because it's a respiratory droplet um, spread. Um, 
similar to other uh, viral infection, like just like influenza, um, these droplets can land in mouth or noses of people if you're close. So that's why it's important that six feet distance. Currently, it's unclear if a person can get coronavirus by touching surfaces. Um, there are some, um, you know, studies, but again, we're all learning, so it's not hard data yet. But what we're learning is, you know, most likely this virus can live outside on the surface, some say 30 minutes, some say longer. So it's important to also clean the high touch surfaces and things like that as well. Yes, and I think this is, is good. We'll come back to this more. But so droplet, when you put someone in droplet precautions in, in the hospital, so if someone has um, one of the other coronaviruses, we, we usually do a mask. So, and droplet precautions are different than airborne precautions that, like TB. Um, so if, if a person is in airborne, you put them in a negative pressure room. Um, and but, currently, CDC is recommending negative pressure room. Mm -hmm. So is most of the states are recommending negative pressure room in hospital setting. Um, so that's what we should follow at this moment. Mm -hmm. Again, I think if we have more patients and we run out of negative pressure rooms, then I think we will go back to drop yes. wood and, uh, and contact. Yes. But for now, it's important to kind of know everything is kind of fluid and we're getting new data at, at, as day goes by exactly, so yeah. we just need to kind of keep up to date on things yes and uh you know things are changing so quickly that you know in a couple days this there are things there are more information we're gonna have more information about this but right so they're saying put people in airborne uh, negative pressure rooms um and usually for coronavirus we don't do that but they're just trying to take extra precautions uh, uh at this time okay and so here um, this is just a little bit of information about uh, how it gets in. So it binds to these ACE2, um, and it says that there are these certain types of cells, the uh, type 2 alveolar cells that express this ACE2 um, um, uh, enzyme or, or protein where it's able to get in. And so the thought is, is it binds to that, and that's how it gets into the lungs. So it gets into the lungs and then goes from there. Um, and right now, some studies are saying that uh, the a little bit of higher proportion of males than females. Uh, some are saying they're higher proportion of males. Some are saying it's the same. I think it's it's kind of early right now. Um, and then they're also saying that children aren't as affected. They're not getting as sick as frequently. And so the thought it might be because the children may not have this uh, these ACE2 um, receptors or the way for it to get in. And males may have more of them. This is also just kind of uh, uh, up in the air, but it's something that's, uh, you know, they'll have more information soon, hopefully. And I think um, incubation period comes up a lot. So um, currently the information we know is from one to 14 days with the median of uh, five to six days. Uh, median age of the infected patients um, most of the time is around 50 and slightly male predominance. So as far as clinical presentation, so most people, it looks like, have a fever, uh, dry cough, fatigue, myalgias. I mean, these are type of things that if someone came in with these, uh, and most of them are mild, right? Over 80% are mild. So if, if someone came in, I mean, this is kind of what you'd expect from a coronavirus just in general, maybe, would be uh, kind of feeling fatigued and tired, uh, might have a fever. Um, and most of them are uh, seem to be mild. So when they, they come in, um, you know, and you're trying to evaluate them, it's hard to tell this from other viral illnesses. Yeah, um, I think emphasizing the point that over 80% of the cases are very mild cases. So I think, um, you know, speaking to this to our patients is going to be really important um, so that they're kind of aware of, um, you know, the percent of patients that, you know, they mostly get mild cases. Most of them present with fevers and dry cough. And then, you know, if it's more moderate or severe, then you have to add on the shortness of breath. But for majority of the cases, it's mild. Right. And they were interviewing some patients that had it, uh, I think, on the cruise ship. And they were saying, you know, I didn't feel that bad. I, I think they even said I would have still gone to work. Yeah. <laughs> they said it wasn't really that bad. And, and that's the majority of cases, like all, like, uh, pretty much every viral illness. Most people don't feel that bad or may not even know that they, they had it. So labs, so a good percentage of them have lymphopenia, so uh, prolonged thrombin times, elevated lactate dehydrogenase, uh, they have elevated uh, CRP, 
um, it, it kind of, you know, wouldn't be out of the ordinary for other viral illnesses. And then uh, for chest CT, um, usually um, with, uh, when you have a moderate or severe infection, you have characteristic of bi patchy infiltrates, ground glass infiltrates. So we have some pictures on the next slide. So if you see here, you could see that some of these um, um, CT scans that were for the patients with um, uh, COVID-19 infection. Can you kind of um, show the ground glass? Oh, sure. So here the, there's ground glass. So this is usually what they see. It's usually in the lower lobes. Yeah. Um, and, and so this was an interesting article, um, kind of the radiology perspective, kind of just showing. And ground glass can happen in many things. Yes. Uh, so it, it wouldn't be something where you'd say it <clears throat> you, and the radiologist would say, oh, this is definitely, you know, one type, one virus yeah. versus another. Virus can cause ground glass. You know, you could have atypical infection with fungal infection or AFB or, you know, so a lot of different things causes ground glass infiltrate. But now if there, if we have this infection in our community, then something to keep in back of our mind. Again, a lot of the states, I think it's really important to know, we do not have community spread as of now. So I think that is really important to emphasize to our patients and to our healthcare workers too. Right. So, I mean, if you're seeing this this is all, you know, when it uh, spreads or, mm -hmm. or if it spreads, yeah. um, uh, something to keep in mind. If you see this, I wouldn't jump straight to, uh, straight to this. I mean, uh, they're also seeing bilateral lung involvement, mainly the lower lobes, um, lower part of the lung. And your upper respiratory symptoms were less common. Uh, and I think it's, it's mainly the lower uh, parts of the lung. But essentially, you can see um, it doesn't look normal. And when um, they were doing these imaging uh, studies. Uh, some of the patients didn't have didn't have too bad of symptoms, and there was actually I think it looked a little bit worse on the CT scan than, than the patients actually felt. So most patients that get this, um, you know, or many patients that get this probably uh, may go unnoticed yeah. and get better um, get better anyway, even though the imaging may look, uh, you know, kind of startling. So histopath, so as far as, uh, you know, if, if there are gonna be slides done for pathology, they're seeing hyaline uh, membrane formation, interstitial mononuclear inf inflammatory infiltrates, uh, multinucleated giant cells. These are things that they also saw with SARS, um, uh, the first SARS and, and also with MERS. So this wouldn't be too surprising, but so it's not something be, that you would diagnose. Yeah, of. so this will be really helpful for the pathologist if they're looking at a slide or a specimen. So, you know, we have um, been um, getting a lot of questions about, is there a treatment? So treatment um, for any type of viral infections, including for COVID-19 infection is mainly supportive. So if you have a mild infection, you know, stay at home, drink plenty of fluids, rest, you know, take anti um, fever medicine like Tylenol or ibuprofen and get better, mm -hmm. right? That home supportive care. If you're in the hospital, you know, if you're a little dehydrated, give IV fluids and things that we would normally do. If you have a severe case, then, you know, supportive um, care would be ventilator support or a BiPAP support. So mostly all supportive care. But reading through literature, there are some um, uh, patients in different countries, they've tried different medications. Um, and one of the medications that they have tried is lopinavir and vertonavir. It's a combination pill that we usually use for HIV patients. But they have you in um, a study in Thailand, the number of patients treated were extremely small. So again, make sure we um, remember that. But they used this with high dose Tamiflu, and they had uh, most of the patients, I think nine or ten, recovered well. So there's, you know, so. If I have an extremely severe case, I wouldn't mind using what I have to try to help the patient. Right, exactly. So it's all it, it's not an indication right now. Yes. Um, and it, it would all be off-label. And so it's something that um, in the, the few patients or in the patients that get really sick and uh, uh, we don't really have options uh, as far as a recommended thing to give. So people are trying different things. These are some of the things they're trying. I think that uh, uh, you know it would be reasonable if you had someone very sick that yeah. to consider trying it, but 
again, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks before this spreads too much, we'll be able to get more information on, on exactly. Uh, and then we could keep everybody up to date on the newer information we're getting. Um, can some people spread the virus without being sick? So the uh, people that are spreading the virus for the most part are symptomatic, the sickest. So, you know, you have to have cough, fevers. Um, there are some, um, you know, some uh, spread might be possible before people become uh, symptoms, but that's very low chance. So the most um, uh, people that spread the infection are have symptoms. And here's a really nice uh, poster from CDC kind of giving a quick synopsis. So the most common um, uh, fever, cough, and then um, shortness of breath in moderate or severe cases. Right, so uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath. So most people uh, feel uh, a little bit sick, but not too sick. I think, I think that's something that we're repeating a little bit, but it's, it's uh, important to realize that uh, most people do very well and uh, yeah and the reason we are repeating it is um, um, I feel like there's a lot of questions on the COVID-19 infection and I think if we can all speak to this I think we could really give the right information for our, to our patients and other healthcare workers so then we could um, work together and I know we could take care of this but I think it's about how are we going to handle and being able to stay right. calm. And as far as uh, when they look at how sick people get and how severe, uh, part of the issue is that when people go to the hospital and, and they discover uh, that, that this is in a community, uh, they're counting really the sickest people. They're not counting the people that, um, like I said, that that, uh, you that had a mild case that yeah. said, oh, I didn't feel too bad. Yeah. So they don't even get included. So the asymptomatic cases or uh, whether, whether they um, uh, have a, a very mild illness or um yeah and it's kind of scary when you hear all the statistics right. you know today <clears throat> we had world in the world 80,000 cases right total but we have to remember like how many of them did we not even capture because yes. you know then yeah. because we get all these data on okay now serious you know um, adverse outcome is less than two percent but is it really less than two percent or is it even below that so I think we have to yeah. take all the information like carefully exactly, and understand. Right. Yeah. So when outbreaks first start, the numbers are, are, are always higher than they actually are, yes. right? So, so when we get further down the line, we'll, we'll have more information. Um, so a CDC test for um, COVID-19. Um, so CDC has developed a new lab um, test kit. Um, it's a PCR test. Uh, for example, in Nebraska, our Nebraska Public Health Lab can run the test. Um, and then um, I also knew, um, you know, as, as things are changing, um, a lot of the university labs are able to run the test now as well. And, you know, I think the goal is most of the labs at facilities are able to run the test eventually. Um, so um, more and more tests capabilities are on its way and, and PCR being the um, uh, diagnostic tool but I was also listening to WHO yesterday um, where uh, apparently they're in the process of developing serological test so um, you know IgG IgM test and they think maybe in the next couple of weeks that might be done as well so that, that's on the WHO part they were talking about right and I think for the tests right now they're talking about nasopharyngeal not yes. not oral not it's not a throat swab yeah it's no. nasopharyngeal test yep. And then I do want to emphasize on the test. So let's say that um, if you guys have a patient in your clinic, because I get this question a lot, um, and they, they, you know, you screen them and you're worried about they travel to an area with um, community spread or they were close to somebody with um, COVID-19 infection, they're in your clinic immediately, you know, they should be wearing a mask. Um, of you as the physician, um, you walk in into the room, you, you know, if they screen high risk, then you need to be wearing gown, gloves, mask, and eye protection. And if you decide to do a nasopharyngeal swab, um, you're creating um, aerosolization. Oh, yeah. So it's really important that you're wearing your PPE if you're going to do that. Um, and also doing that in the room, clinic room and, you know, when we do rapid influenza tests, we take everything and outside into the countertop, 
that wouldn't be ideal. So, uh, or what you do is do the test and send the test to an approved site to run the test. So it's little things, but we need to kind of think through at each facility. Yeah, and I think that's excellent. I think that um, uh, a lot of these coronavirus and coronaviruses in general, um, a, a lot of them are health, they consider them healthcare associated because a lot of the spread can actually help uh, be spread in healthcare settings. And so, um, so our en environmental cleaning and disinfection, routine cleaning disinfection procedures are appropriate, uh, including those patient care areas with uh, aerosol generating procedures. So aerosol generating procedures, that's like uh, putting it out into the air uh, and makes it easier to spread as you were yeah. saying with the collection. Um, it's um, one of the other thing it's really important is that in every facility, um, you know, as we have a team that is currently working on how to address the COVID-19 infection, we need to be talking to our EVS staff uh, because it's really important for them to know how long do you leave a room closed? How do you clean a room? What products do you use to clean a room? What um, personal protective equipment do, does our EVS uh, personnel need to wear to clean their room? So I think let's not forget they're a key member to, um, to this team. So prevention. Avoid close contact with sick people. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, mouth with unwashed hand. Uh, stay home when you're sick. And then cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue. You know, uh, clean and disinfect frequently, touch objects. <clears throat> and then wash your hands often with soap and water. So, I mean, really, the most important is, is wash your hands with soap and water. And yeah. if we could repeat that over and over, I think that would be yes. <laughs> the, uh, one of the, the main points. So. It's hard to get people to wash with with soap and water, uh, even getting clinicians to wash before they see before and after seeing a patient. But yeah. it's really one of the best things that we can do. Um, so I was keeping a track of like the level three um, 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 countries where travel is not recommended, and uh, Hong Kong was on the level limited spread. They were having issues with spread. But well, um, currently they're off that list because apparently one of the biggest things that they initiated in Hong Kong was hand hygiene oh. um, to the public and to the healthcare workers. And now they're, they have containing their spread. So I think key to everything is hand hygiene. Yes. And then if you're gonna do soap and water, remembering to do 20 seconds or uh, remembering to you know, sing the happy birthday song in your head while you're washing your hand. But we must do it for 20 seconds. Right. And looking back on uh, 1918, um, the Spanish flu. So one of the things that the cities did early was, was self-isolation, um, uh, um, where they had people stay home. And the cities where they had people stay home earlier actually had better outcomes. And that's one of the things where, you know, if you're feeling sick, um, you know, it, the best thing you can do is is do what you would do for if you were were sick uh, any other time. The best thing would not would be not to go to work, stay home, self isolate, uh, and and try not to spread it. Yeah, just get better at home. Um, so another question we've been asking a lot about face masks. Um, so if I'm currently well, I do not need a face mask to go in the public or walk around. That just gives us a false sense of protection, um, but it really doesn't um, you know, prevent you from getting the infection. People who should be wearing the face mask, uh, if you have upper respiratory, lower respiratory symptoms, then of course you wear the mask and you protect the people around you. And of course, healthcare workers when we're seeing sick patients. But you know, there's so, um, uh, face masks are such like um, scared resource right now, and I think it's really important for us to um, keep in mind um, not to use it unnecessarily, and only people, healthcare workers, and, uh, and the patients who are uh, showing symptoms. We have a right. question: um, Is the hand hygiene with alcohol not recommended for this particular virus? Oh no! Thank. Uh, great question. No, you can use hand um, hand sanitizer as well. Um, you know, as long as the hand sanitizer has over sixty percent alcohol content, which is great. So if you do soap and water or use um, um, alcohol hand sanitizer, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, that's a good question because when I think virus, I usually think you have to wash your hands, and I don't think as much as uh, the 
the alcohol gels, but they do work. Yeah, they yeah. work. Um, uh, the, just remember, like if your hands are soiled, then alcohol, hand sanitizer doesn't help. In that case, soap and water, but otherwise um, hand sanitizer works really well. Mm -hmm. Next question is, do we need to get nasopharyngeal swab from the state lab for this test, or can we use our own nasopharyngeal swab? Uh, um, I think you could use your own, but you know, anytime you're actually gonna run a COVID-19 infection, um, a test, um, you're probably gonna first call your local health department and they will guide you through. But from what I am um, hearing, we could use the um, a nasopharyngeal swab we have in our hospital. And another important uh, point about face masks is that, uh, and we'll talk about it in a second, donning and doffing the equipment. So if someone wears a face mask and they're up close with someone, it's important not to grab the face mask with, with your hand uh, because uh, then you're just kind of putting contaminating, it up, put, it. contaminating your hand and, and putting how you put things on and off but um, uh, is, is very important, which they uh, talked a lot about yeah. in the Ebola um, uh, outbreak. So as far as face masks go, so um, should you be wearing a face mask when you go out in public? Really the recommendation is not to do that. No. Um, it's most important if, uh, if someone feels sick or they're frequently coughing, if they're, but they shouldn't really be in big crowds yeah. anyway. So, but if somebody yeah. comes to the clinic, and they have runny nose or cough or fevers, of course, immediately yes. your healthcare facilities practice should be give them a mask, they put it on, and then you take them into a room. Yes. Uh, um, and then, then, of course, when a healthcare worker is seeing a patient with um, respiratory symptoms, they should be wearing a mask to protect themselves. Uh, when to contact uh, OC Health. So if you have an unprotected exposure, you're not wearing recommended uh, personal protection, uh, to confirm a possible COVID-19 patient, then you, you call your supervisor, call your occupational health and discuss it with them and, and see what, what their pro your specific protocols are and uh, how they want to uh, proceed. So if you develop symptoms, um, then you would also not report to work and you would contact your occupational health. And here's a quick map of where this infection is right now. Some have really high infection, some have only like 12 cases, but it's a nice map from CDC. Um, and also it's important to know how to find the information, where are the local transmission happening in a high level? So if you go to CDC um, um, uh, coronavirus, and, and then if you enter that site, they also have travel alerts, so it's really helpful. So, you know, it keeps changing. Right now, these are the travel alerts. Again, like I was saying, Hong Kong was on this, but as they're, they are containing their infection, and, and one of the big reasons is from hand hygiene. And uh, cases reported in US, um, currently in California and Washington state, and there have been other uh, cases, um, lower number in other states in US as well. And this is a really nice map from CDC where it shows all the states that have, that are currently testing in their public health labs and certain states where they're in process of testing. And again, this map might already be old. I got it yesterday. You know, they might already be up and going. So I'm assuming a lot of the states are getting multiple sites now. Um, so there's some information on the CDC site um, and I think these steps are really important. Um, and then the first, um, it says uh, steps healthcare facilities can take now to prepare for um, COVID-19 infection. So be prepared. Say, um, so some of the bullet points are stay informed about the local COVID-19 situation. So you guys need to be kind of keeping an eye on in your local area, in your state, what is the COVID-19? Is there community spread um, or how are you guys doing? Develop and review your own facility emergency plan, which is extremely important. Establish a relationship with key healthcare and public healthcare partners in your community. It, this is when you have an um, infection like this, it's important we all work as a team. We collaborate, we work with all the different healthcare settings, and we just do the right thing for our patients and our population. Create an emergency contact list for your uh, facility. Right, and this and about staying informed, CDC is really where I get my information. I think that's the best place to go. Um, there's a lot of information on social media by people saying, 
yeah. uh, you know, either they're very excited or they're not excited. I think the most important thing is to to look at the facts. Yes. I think the facts are are the best thing, and you can look at it and and kind of um, uh, see what the facts are, and not kind of what people are saying yes. on uh, on social media. And um, it's really, you know, to create a team for each of your healthcare facility. I'm sure you guys already have, but like the key members should include, these are some examples. I'm not saying you have to have all these members, but it, you know, dip on your in your healthcare facility, it's important to have the primary care doc, the hospitalist, if you have ICU doctors, you know, your admin, your infection preventionist, your nursing, the respiratory therapist, your EVS staff, a safety and public relations. So all of these members need to be on your incident command so that when there's um, uh, issues that come about, you can work together to address that issue for your healthcare facility. And then uh, steps healthcare facilities can take now to prepare. So communicate with staff and patients, communicate uh, about COVID-19, share information, what is currently known, um, and potentials for a surge in your, your facility's preparedness plan. So it's important to have a plan in place. So when things you start seeing patients with this, uh, it, everyone doesn't get super worked up if there's already a plan in place and, and uh, people know what, what to do. Yeah, and I think the communication part is really key to um, and telling our patients and also our healthcare workers that more than 80% of the patients with this infection just have like a common cold-like symptoms. Um, that is really important to continue to re-emphasize. And then also re-emphasize that patients that have severe infections are elderly patients who have comorbidities like diabetes, heart disease, COPD, uh, COPD. Right. yeah, you know, those are the patients that, ha that are having higher, um, uh, you know, severe infection. But then again, those are the same type of patients that have influenza infection mm -hmm. that affects them badly as well. So I think it's really important to reassure majority of us are going to be okay. And then how do we help protect our vulnerable population? So protecting patients and protecting workforce. So screen patients and visitors for symptoms um, as they enter and, and try to, like you said earlier, put a, put a mask on them, uh, isolate them out so they're not spreading it at, uh, at the hospital, ensure proper use of, of the uh, personal protection uh, equipment, conduct an inventory of available PPE, encourage sick employees to stay home. So these are things that, um, you know, you want to look at as a facility and, and try to make sure that everything, um, uh, that there's a plan in place and, and what to do when, when people show up. And protect your patients. So stay up to date, separate patients away with symptoms, uh, consider strategies for, uh, to prevent patients uh, who can be cared at home from coming into your facility. So sometimes, and sometimes in the news it'll say, can you believe it, this patient might have symptoms and they sent him home? And I look at that and I think, that's a good That's thing. That's a good thing because, yeah. because um, and they'll say, sometimes they'll say, oh, this patient, and, and there's a, there was an article about this patient saying they didn't even test me, they just sent me home. And, uh, you know, he looked really good to me, yeah. I don't know. But, but if, if a, it's the same thing, uh, you know, if a patient has a cold. Um, now, you would say that the important thing with identifying that patient is having uh, COVID-19 would be that he doesn't, he doesn't spread it. And, yeah. Perhaps one of the best ways to not spread it would be to go home and, and be at home for uh, a week or two to self-isolate. And so it, it could be that, that some of these patients that are, are complaining uh, may have had COVID-19, but if they go home and self-isolate, that's the best thing to do rather than stay, stay in the hospital and potentially you know, our, infect other people. Yeah, put our high-risk patients at risk. Um, so again, uh, minimize chances of exposure. So when patients are coming in, um, when scheduling appointment, instruct patients and uh, persons who are accompanying them to call ahead. So it's really, um, so what we're emphasizing is um, if somebody is concerned that they may have COVID-19 infection to call ahead, if they're coming to a healthcare, um, you know, their PCP or they're coming to the emergency department, call ahead. So then the healthcare facility is prepared and they could immediately give them a mask and take them into a room. So I think sending that message 
everywhere and we all on the same page would be really helpful to you know keep you know less people getting infection um, and upon arrival ensure rapid triage and isolation of the patient and provide supplies for respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Um, and then again, here's that answer, including um, 60 to 95% alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So it, you know, if in your healthcare facility, if you have alcohol hand sanitizer, 60% or more, you're, that's fine. So for employees, because you know, as healthcare workers, we are pretty bad when we get a sick, we still show up to work. But in this case, it's really important. Do not come to work if you're sick. Use proper respiratory etiquette. Perform proper hand hygiene. Follow standard precaution for every patient and isolation precautions indicated and proper use of PPE. And then personal protective equipment. So gloves, gowns, respiratory protection. And, and they're talking about wearing an eye shield. And an eye shield, so, uh, with droplets, as droplets go into the air, if they um, hit hit the eyes, then there's that's the concern. Um, usually, I think it's it's more so along along the lines of people coughing and um, or touching something and then touching their eyes um, or touching the patient with your gloves and then taking your gloves off and rubbing your face. You know, these are um, things that they're worried about. Usually, we don't have eye protection when we're in in droplet, um, although. If a patient is, is coughing excessively, then that's one to consider it. Yeah, with COVID-19 infection, it's kind of considered more highly infectious. Yeah, so, so everybody, right. Yeah, so it's really important to make sure gown, gloves, respiratory protection with mask and eye protection. So this is a really nice um, um, diagram, um, flow sheet on how do you don and doff. And I think it might be really good in your healthcare facility. You know, uh, our best allies are infection preventionists at each healthcare facility. So maybe even doing some, um, you know, going through this and making sure you know how to properly don and doff. Right, and <clears throat> this is putting on, and then here's taking off. And with Ebola, they would actually partner up and they would have a partner watch and see how they take it off. And then they would say, oh, your, yeah. your hand is infected or, or think about this or that, and they would help each other and work together. Yeah, but if, you know, just remember Ebola was very highly infectious. Right. And here, <laughs> right. Two separate so, infections. Oh, no, I just mean that as, as an example of, <laughs> yeah. of you know, yeah, partnering up and, yes. and watching just because. Yes. Uh, but it'll be good yeah. to make sure we give each other feedback how we don and off. And it's really important to follow, take off the gown, then the gloves then the eye shield, um, sorry, goggles, and then your mask, and then you wash your hands really well with either uh, soap and water or alcohol. And I also think we need to start thinking outside the box. Um, so if you have, um, um, you know, partner with all the healthcare, um, um, uh, healthcare facilities, state, local, around you, so we could all work as a team. Right, <clears throat> and telemedicine is a good way, um, you know, it, if, if, if possible to try and isolate the patients and, and uh, uh, if, the, if the provider is not exposing, exposing themselves to the patient as much as possible. And then another thing is also having telemedicine platforms. So like patients can actually call you from their house and then talk to um, you know, a provider and say, hey, I'm having some cough, I'm having some fever. And then you could evaluate them over that platform so that they don't have to come into the healthcare facility. So you know, there's some other we could think about different solutions so that we don't get so many patients coming to our ER and clinic. In South Korea, they had a fantastic idea where they were doing testing for um, COVID-19 infection through drive throughs So the patient stayed in the car and then um, healthcare per, um, personnel with personal protective equipment just did the test. So they did drive through testing. If employees can work from home, so, you know, if you have certain, um, you know, uh, employees in certain part of the hospital, they could do the same job from home. That might be an option. Um, and then give resources to your patient if they're self-quarantined. So, you know, they could get meals on wheels or can they order food on Grubhub or can they order grocery on Instacart or Uber Eats. So providing these other things that could like deliver food or groceries will be really helpful. And keep calm and wash your hands. So. <laughs> Um, a big part of this is is overloading the system, like you were saying. So um, the concern is is that if patients, if too many patients go to the ER, it'll just over overwhelm the system. So, uh, and what I mean by that is, if every patient with a fever showed up, 
it might be uh, really difficult for the, the ER to keep up with kind of a surge of patients when most of the time uh, the patients are, are, are fine. So it's, it's really, if every patient with um, uh, RSV or uh, enterovirus or anything, if they say, oh my gosh, and it, it's, it's this anxiety that yeah. everybody overloads, whether for whatever reason they're having a fever, it, it could really overload the system. Yeah, we need to protect our healthcare system so we could take care of the really sick patients. Yes, exactly. So we are done. So any questions you guys have, please feel free to um, uh, type it in. So one question we have now is, are airborne precaution with N95 or PAPR still the current recommendation? Yes. So um, in hospitals, if we, um, if we have a patient, airborne precaution is still the current recommendation with N95 or PAPR for the healthcare personnel. Um, and in clinic where you do not have N95 rooms, you could just make sure the patient should continue to wear their mask and then you put them in a room and the healthcare provider, when they enter the room, they need to go with full PPE. I hope that answers your question. Is there any other questions? Right, and, and we should stress there's still a lot of things that are unknown right now. Um, you know, when uh, H1N1 in 2009, and when that went around, there was uh, a big concern, and I can see why some people can kind of be jaded because they'll say, well, they had bird flu, and they had this, and they had that, and, uh, um, but uh, I think this is the biggest response ever to one of these outbreaks. Yeah, and I... I really think um, if we can all work together and we all stay calm and we keep yes. ourselves up to date and give our patients the right information and think a little bit outside the box. So like, you know, using telemedicine platforms and things like that. So we don't mm -hmm. all burden our healthcare system. We'll be fine. Um, and then, you know, we, and protecting a, a vulnerable population. Right. And, and each one and one in 2009 in the first season, it, it, in, it infected, the thought was it infected one out of every five people in the whole world, but the mortality rate was much lower than first, than first thought. So, uh, and that could happen with this. It could spread around the world. And the thought is, is that we will see patients, but is it going to be as bad as people are saying? And oftentimes it, it's really exaggerated in, in the yeah. very beginning. So I think it's, yeah, I it agree. could be just, and, and Dr. Fossey was saying that it could be just like a bad flu season. Yes. And so if, and, and if, if we were seeing the news and every day it said 500 more people are sick with flu in your state, I would be freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, part of this is, is how the media is portraying it and how it's, it's kind of... Uh, and it's our job to give the right information. Right. And if you look at the CDC data right now for influenza, there's over 30, 24 million people infected with influenza in U.S. and over 18,000 people have died from the influenza. Yes. But if you then take that perspective and now look at COVID-19 infection, we have had love and deaths with COVID-19 infection. So I think it's yes. really important to like not overreact. And if, if the news said every day there's been another death in your community, community from flu, and then the next day they say there are 10 more deaths in your community, uh, that would be very frightening. If a patient needs a non-rebreather mask, how do you handle masking the patient? If a patient needs a non-rebreather mask? Oh, then, well, then you would essentially isolate the patient in, a, uh, in, in their own isolation, isolated room, and the um, healthcare workers would wear masks themselves. So if they had a non-rebreather mask, um, you wouldn't be able to put a, another mask on the patient, right? Yeah, right. Right. And so, um, right. It's, I mean, that's the, you could kind of think of it as, as if the person were on a ventilator, how yeah. you, you wouldn't worry about um, putting a mask on them if they were on a ventilator. The ventilator has very good. Yeah. Um, um, the patient is wearing a mask temporarily until you wear your personal protective right. equipment. Then you're protected. Yes. So the patient is doing that to protect you. Once you have your personal protective equipment, you're okay. Right. Any other questions? Well, All thank right. you very thank much. Thank you for joining us. You know, if there are any questions, please feel free to, to email or call us uh, uh, with any questions that you have. Thank you. All right. Thank you.